thank you so much nina for that <laughs> yeah yes uh, as i was saying uh, we are now starting off with ecclesiastes and we will also try to quickly look at song of solomon before our class is done uh, ecclesiastes as we um, you know is generally believed uh, was written by solomon but then we also have evidence which seems to indicate that maybe it was somebody else who wrote it because the author does not identify himself by his name he just simply calls himself uh, in ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 1 he describes himself as teacher son of david king in jerusalem so he talks about himself as a son or a descendant of david and he also says that he is a king in jerusalem but it may not be solomon simply because uh, in ecclesiastes 116 and in a few other places he sounds as if he has many many kings before his time came on the other hand we know that before solomon came there was only one single king who was his father david um so maybe we could actually read ecclesiastes 116 if one of us could please read out that verse here he said uh, i have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over jerusalem before me he sounds as if there are multiple um, kings who were there before him and he uses this kind of a phrase even in other portions of this uh, book of ecclesiastes another very strong indicator is that here in the book of ecclesiastes you have many aramaic words and phrases but as far as we know in 10th century bc when solomon was ruling at that time aramaic was not being used in the land of israel at all it was only later in the 3rd century bc that aramaic begins to make uh, you know its entrance it becomes popular popular to such an extent that people start using aramaic phrases even in the hebrew uh, scrolls and so um, it appears that maybe this person who was writing this book is a descendant of david he is a son of david and he is a king but it may not be solomon himself okay um so let's just hold on to that in our minds even as we go through this book now the main word which is used in this book is that hebrew word hevel okay hevel is the hebrew word which is used again and again by the author and um, in ecclesiastes 1 verses 1 to 2 uh, this is what the author says uh, the words of the teacher son of david king in jerusalem you know if we were to use the actual hebrew word he says hevel hevel says the teacher utterly hevelless hevel everything is hevel what on earth is this hebrew word hevel and uh, we have this very ancient english word vanity which is used in our kjv and uh, the word vanity has now lost its original meaning and it's probably not a very good translation to be used anymore which is why niv tries to use the word meaningless okay so the word hevel can be better translated as something that is meaningless it doesn't seem to make sense it doesn't seem to have any good meaning or purpose because actually the word yeah, thanks the word hevel uh, literally means vapor or mist or breath you know when on a very cold day when you're speaking or you're breathing you can literally see the vapor come out of your uh, nose right up out of your nostrils so uh, it's talking about that kind of a vapor and vapor just lasts for a few seconds you just see it and then it disappears the morning mist it's just there till the sun comes out and then the mist disappears so it's a very temporary thing and that is the word which is being used over here and the teacher says hevel hevel says the teacher everything is hevel everything is so temporary everything is so short in time that where's the point what's the meaning of all of this 
okay that's the main theme which comes out in this um, book of ecclesiastes uh, because this author seems to be very very bothered by the, by the shortness of everything that happens over here and because everything is so temporary over here on this uh, on this earth he thinks what are we achieving through all of this and he goes on to look at different aspects of life under the sun he looks at wisdom he looks at work he looks at wealth and riches he looks at power he looks at uh, uh, the achievements which humans make he looks at the whole uh, you know area of pleasure and enjoyment uh, he looks at religion he looks at philosophy he looks at all of these things and he you know gives his comments on each of these things and he says you know people do all of these things but it's just there for a little while and then it's over so what is the meaning of all of this so throughout this book this man is trying to understand the meaning of life all of these things that people are you know are engaged in day by day uh, the work they do the wisdom they try to seek the things that they try to achieve the wealth which they try to accumulate all of it is so temporary it's so heavy it's like a breath it's there for a moment and then it's gone so what is the meaning of all of this is what he continues to ask throughout the book so we'll just look at a few verses um maybe we can actually look at uh, you know because after all this is supposed to be these are supposed to be the wisdom books so let's look at what he says about wisdom and it's something very interesting that he says a uh, very uh, valid point you could say which he makes over here so if someone could read out ecclesiastes chapter 2 verses 15 and 16 mm Verse 16. Okay, so he's saying, okay, let us say that I, you know, pursue wisdom. I really want to be wise. I really want to understand things. Let us say that I, you know, spend my entire life trying to gain wisdom. but the fate of the fool will overtake me also you know he says so what then do i gain by being wise and so i he says i said to myself this too is heaven just to think temporary thing it's here now gone and um, so he says in uh, verse 16 like the fool the wise too must die so where's the point in even trying to pursue wisdom where's the point in even trying to be wise okay is 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 a point which he makes and now let's look at what he says uh, of course you know we will look at this um, and try to uh, you know come to a good conclusion a biblical conclusion but first let's look at the observations that this person is making okay let's move on into ecclesiastes chapter 2 uh, verses 18 to 21 here is talking about you know the hard work sincere hard work which people put in and all the riches which they gather and this is what he says about that uh, ecclesiastes 2 18 to 21 if someone could read out uh then I'll spend the end right okay so he says let us say that i work very hard with wisdom and knowledge and skill and i achieve all of these things and then what happens i have to die and then when i after i die 
all these things we all these things which i have so you know painstakingly gathered it will go to another person and he says who knows whether that person will be wise or a fool if he's a fool he will you know mismanage everything which I, which i have worked hard for he will waste away everything that i have so carefully put together so he says where is the point and uh, uh, so, uh, so in verse 21 he says they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it that man has not even worked put in any hard work and he's just going to gain everything which i have worked for what is the meaning of this where is the point in all of this you know is what he asks so uh, we see here a man who sincerely wants to know he's not a person who's just satisfied with making money and you know um, going about having a comfortable life and just being uh, satisfied at that level he is longing sa higher he truly wants to understand why he is here on this planet what he is here for what is going to happen in the future and is there any purpose a greater purpose something wonderful to look forward to at the end of all of this effort and toil and hard work and um, so he says in ecclesiastes 8 17 this is what he says you know uh, he's been um, dwelling upon this verse after verse carefully he's been thinking out the different aspects of this life and this is what he says in ecclesiastes 8 17 he says then i saw all that god has done no one can comprehend what goes on under the sun despite all their efforts to search it out no one can discover its meaning even if the wise claim they know they cannot really comprehend it so he says i have tried other people have tried we have tried to understand but really it's not actually possible to really understand what uh, you know god is doing on this earth okay is the cry of frustration which he lets out over here and we see something similar that he says in ecclesiastes 3 verses 10 and 11 there he says i have seen the burden god has laid on the human race he has made everything beautiful in its time he has also set eternity in the human heart yet no one can fathom what god has done from beginning to end so what god has done is beautiful he makes everything beautiful in its time he has even put eternity in our hearts but no one can really dig fathom dig deep and find out what is the meaning of all of this that's going on from beginning to end and so this is the cry of his heart and then at the end of ecclesiastes he says in, a, in chapter 12 at the very end in verses 13 and 14 he says now all has been heard you know because he has he has finished talking about all the aspects of life so he says now all has been heard here is the conclusion of the matter and he says fear god and keep his commandments for this is the duty of all mankind for god um will bring every deed into judgment including every hidden thing whether it is good or evil so after having tried to understand and having failed to understand what exactly is this life all about he finally says there are things which we really cannot understand now just because we do not understand it doesn't mean that you can rebel against god and go do whatever you want you can't just throw up your hands and say oh this life is meaningless so i think i'll just go and do whatever i randomly feel like doing no even though you may not understand even though i may not understand what is happening in this life we still have a duty towards our creator and so he says we must fear god and keep his commandments for this is the duty of all mankind why because god will be judging everything that we do even the hidden things that we do he will be judging and so we need to uh, honor him even though we have not fully understood all that has been all that god is doing on this earth from beginning to end okay and the book closes at that point and for us who are living in new testament times this seems like a very incomplete ending it's almost like as if you know the episode ended without giving the end of the story and so you're thinking oh there has to be a follow up there should be one more episode to explain what exactly this is about because we have we have been kind of left with a half answer 
the half answer which we find in Ecclesiastes is that um, it's true that we are not able to understand the true meaning of this life, but let us not become rebels. Let us not dishonor God. Let us fear him. Let us obey him. Let us trust and obey him and leave things in his hands. And one day he will judge us for what we have done and what we have not done. And he just leaves it like that. But there's still that big question. What is the meaning of this life? And that continues. I know that's a question which continues uh, to haunt the reader. And it's when we come to the New Testament that the curtain is drawn back. And suddenly now we are given a lot of additional details which were not given in the Old Testament. So in Old Testament times, a lot of things were kept hidden, which is why um, I don't know whether you have, you have come across this term in any of your courses, you know, what they talk about uh, uh, when they say progressive revelation. In the very beginning, uh, when Abraham, you know, and Isaac and Jacob and all were there, they were given very few details. In fact, they were not even told the details of the name Yahweh at that time. Very limited revelation was given. And then when, when we come into the time of Moses, there's some more progressive revelation. They, they get to know many more things about what's happening. And then when you come to the time of the prophets, the prophets start talking about all the things which will happen in the future. And the revelation, the level of revelation increases. So throughout the scriptures, we see that there's a progressive revelation going on. And here in Ecclesiastes, this man, this writer, still does not have a very clear picture of what exactly God is planning. And so he mainly goes on talking about things which are under the sun. And uh, you know, uh, if you look in commentaries, it would say that this particular phrase, under the sun, is used 27 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. So under the sun, he's looking at science, human achievement, philosophy, religion. is looking at all of these things which are under the sun and it just seems to be very incomplete. It doesn't seem to be, doesn't seem to completely make sense and it's not giving him the full picture. And that is why he longs to know what is going on because he observes, right, very, very correctly, he observes in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, he says, God has put eternity in our hearts. So inside the human being, there is a longing to know what is this bigger picture? What exactly are we moving towards? What is actually going to happen? Is there an outcome? Or is what we see over here under the sun, is that it? Is there something more? We have a longing for it. You know, you go to a cat or a dog and you ask it, what is the meaning of life? If that cat or dog could talk, it would say, what does it matter what the meaning of life is? If you get, if you can get your food on time, if you can roam around and, you know, you know, just enjoy your freedom, enough. But you see, the dog and cat do not have eternity put in their hearts. But we humans who have been created in the image of God, we can't be satisfied at that level. We want more. We, we, not, we want to know more. We long for more automatically because of the way we have been made. And so in the New Testament, we get to see that there's a lot happening above the sun where God is sitting on his throne and he has an eternal plan for mankind. And we are all part of that eternal plan. So the work that we are doing here on this earth, the wisdom which we are trying to acquire over here, um, the, all the achievements that we are putting you know, our effort into, all of these things don't just end at death. You know, like, you know, the, the writer of Ecclesiastes, he says, what's the point? In the end, the fool will die. The wise man also will die. Both are having the same ending. But you see, this is not the end. Because above the sun, there's something else going on. People will continue to exist. They will either enjoy the rewards of the way they have lived in God's presence. You know, they will enjoy his presence for the rest of their lives. Or they will just be cast into hell where there's no future at all for them throughout eternity. So there's something bigger going on, which is why you know we work the way we do. We put in the effort which we put in. We don't live like the fool, but we you know we go after God's wisdom and we try to live in you know in fear of God. All of these things. Why are we doing it? Not because anything under the sun has got you know answers for us. It's because we are looking above the sun to see the greater eternal plan awaiting us. 
And so, you know, we can't really get into all of the New Testament scriptures, but maybe we can just very quickly look at Romans 8, 28 to 30, which kind of gives us an idea of what God has in his mind for us. So it's a very familiar passage. If we could have someone read out for us here in the class, Romans 8, 28 to 30. So God's plan is to invite all of this fallen humanity to himself through his son. If they will just place their faith in his son and if they are willing to submit to him and follow him, then he can bring them into his fold and he can start working out his plans in their life. He will start making them into the image of his son because along with his son, they are meant to enjoy a new chapter of life in eternity okay so in old testament times there was a screen covering the new testament times they could not really see many of the things which we know today they could not see those things and there was a it was like as if there were there were curtains covering the new testament times in the same way we who are living now in the new testament we don't know what's going to happen in heaven after the new earth and the new you know the new heaven and the new earth are established the curtains are drawn we can't see but there's something spectacular awaiting. Now imagine the people in the Old Testament times, they were doing the uh, sacrifices in the temple and all that. They never understood the glory of what all of these things meant. They never understood that this little lamb that they are sacrificing is one day going to represent God himself. Like God himself is, is going to come down. He's going to express his love for humanity, you know, and he's going to sacrifice himself on the cross. They never even understood the grandeur, the bigness of what was awaiting in the New Testament until the curtain was drawn back and they could see. In the same way we who are here, we do not know what is awaiting us in the next chapter. And there's something very spectacular awaiting us over there. And we are under the sun preparing ourselves for this grand event which is going to happen because it says in Romans 8 verse 30, you know, he's justifying us because one day we are going to be glorified. We will be in the image of his son and there are things awaiting us, plans and uh, future events and things for us to do and enjoy and take pleasure in. There's a whole life awaiting us in eternity and we still do not know it. But that is what we are working towards. So Ecclesiastes very clearly puts its finger on that, that what we are seeing under the sun is so limited. Only when we bring what is above the sun into the picture and God and all of his glorious plans, then everything opens up and there's so much more beyond awaiting us. OK, so uh, this is just the main crux of what is there in the book of Ecclesiastes. Very quickly, we'll move into Song of Solomon. And uh, here, uh, it's most probably Solomon him himself who wrote it, uh, because uh, one of the main heroes of the story um, you know, is Solomon himself, uh, because he's described and uh, named by name. He's given, uh, you know, uh, if, if, we, if we were to look at uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, where it talks about Solomon and his grandeur, you know, he's coming in, in, in his chariot. And if someone could just read out that Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, where there's a description of Solomon and his, uh, grand, and his grandeur. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, escorted. So uh, it specifically talks about who the hero of the story is. The hero of the story is Solomon, the king who is being talked about. So they say that because it is his story, most probably he's the man who wrote it. Now, the problem with Song of Solomon is that um, there's no chronological order followed. Okay, 
uh, event number 23, which happened on day 47, will be mentioned first. And uh, you know the event number one, which took place at the very beginning of the story, will probably be mentioned somewhere down the line at the end of the book. It's just no chronology followed over here because this is supposed to be a poem. In poetry, they're not thinking in, in the way you know historians think. You know where you'll have day one events and then day two events, day three events. Poetry is all about uh, just um, uh, bringing out the essence of what happened, and so they don't follow chronological order over here. So for someone who enjoys organized, you know, detailed timelines, this book can drive you nuts because you have no clue what's going on over here. What you actually have is a story happening, but this story has got a whole bunch of flashbacks, and the flashbacks are not arranged in order. So one event may have happened first, and another event might have happened second, but they're not mentioned in that particular order. So Song of Solomon basically is this lady sitting over here in the palace, and she's recollecting. She's remembering all the events which took place before, and the, uh, the all the events are not uh, arranged in a proper timeline. Uh, so when the story begins, she has already come as, the, as a bride to the palace of Jerusalem, and she's already has become queen. You know, the, the wedding ceremony is already finished, and now she's already established on the throne. But now she's recollecting the story of how the whole thing began, what and all happened, how did she actually first meet Solomon, and that is the story. Which uh, So if we were to arrange this whole thing in a kind of chronological order, we would get to know a little bit about her background. And we see that in um, uh, chapter 6, uh, even in chapter one, you know, it where it talks a little bit about her background. Again, you have to search the verses to find out about her background. It's not just given neatly like a write-up, you know, like you would have in one of the historical books. But what we get to know about this lady is that she seems to be from a very, very poor family. Uh, you know, this would be your chapter six, verse um, thirteen, where we get to know that she belongs to a very poor family from the tribe of Ephraim. And she was living at a place called Shulam, which is in the region of Baal Harmon. That is basically where this lady was living. And um, that is why she's called the Shulamite, because she belonged to this area of Shulam. That is basically where she was. And we get to know that she was in such a poor condition that her family members, they force her to work in the vineyards. Generally, women were not asked to do physical labor. Yes, they had a lot of hard work you know, in the house, which needed to be done. But they were generally not expected to go out in the fields and work unless they really belong to the poorer strata of society. You know where you can where the family would not be able to afford laborers. So the family members would literally have to go and work over there in the field. So um, in chapter one, verse six, we get to know that her two brothers were forcing her to work in the vineyards, and so she was in that poor condition. And um, in chapter eight, verse eleven, we kind of get the idea that the owner who owned all of these vineyards was the king. King Solomon was the owner of a whole bunch of vineyards, you know, which he would uh, give it out to the different people, and then they would work the land, and then he would make a payment to them. So it looks like she was working in one of the vineyards, which was owned by King Solomon. So one day when he has come to examine his vineyards, she accidentally meets him, and he's uh, probably dressed up as an ordinary person, and she does not realize who he is. Um, because in uh, verse one, um, in chapter one, verse seven, she asks him. She says, "You know, where are you keeping your flocks? Where do you graze them?" Um, maybe someone could read out chapter one, verse seven. Okay, so she says, "Stop treating me like a stranger. Uh, you know, uh, you know, a, a veiled woman whom you do not know. Now that we are getting to know each other, tell me where exactly do you graze your flocks? So in the afternoon, when you need, when you take your sheep 
to, uh, to rest, where do you take them? And there is no answer. The king does not answer because she's under the impression that he's just an ordinary shepherd. She has no idea that he's the king. And so they get to know each other. And then it, we get from, we get the impression from the from the song that uh, at some point of time he leaves and he says you know he leaves her with the promise that he will come back he will return back for her and he goes away he goes away for a very long time and she has no idea where he is where he has gone and in fact she starts wondering whether he'll ever come back or whether he's just forgotten her and is just gone. And then one day she gets the news that would be in chapter three, verses six to seven. She hears that King Solomon is coming and he's coming with all of his warriors. He's coming in his chariot. And that is when she discovers that, oh, my goodness, this person whom I got to know is the king himself. He's not just a shepherd. He is the king. And so the king comes in all of his glory and he takes this poor woman who has no status, nothing. He takes her to his palace and there, you know, she becomes the queen. So this is basically the storyline of this particular book. And um, so it talks about the love between them, where they actually valued and treasured each other. Um, it's very easy to value and treasure a king because after all, a king is a king. But then you know, when you look at it, uh, you know, uh, when you look at her side of it, there's nothing of uh, value in human eyes. It's just somebody from a very poor background. Someone, you know, she says, my skin has become dark because I've been working the entire day out in the field. I'm not like the other women who are fair and beautiful because, you know, I've been whole day, I've been slogging in the sun. So she has nothing from her side. And yet this king, he values her and he chooses to make her his queen. Okay, so the structure of the book, basically from uh, chapter one up to the middle of chapter three, uh, chapter one up to the middle of chapter three is basically um, mainly them getting to know each other and talking about each other. Then uh, the middle of chapter three uh, up to chapter five would be the wedding. And then uh, chapter five onwards is their uh, married life as a couple. So we, we could roughly say that this is the structure of the book. Okay. So Coming to how uh, people have seen this book, how they have interpreted and understood this book over the ages. Okay, so more than anything, first thing, of course, we would see is that this is the story of a couple. And we talk, and the, the book talks about how they love each other and are committed to each other, which is why some wise people they say, How on earth could Solomon have written this book? Because the man had, had absolutely no idea what it is to be faithful to one woman. So how could he have even written such a book? Because in this book, the emphasis is, you know, he says, you are my beloved. Means my eyes are only for you. I'm not busy checking to see all the other women lined up over there who, you know, whom I'm going to marry. No, he's talking about faithfulness to one single person. So they say, okay, fine. If Solomon wrote this book, maybe this was his very first wife. You know, when he still had some idea of what faithfulness is. Because later on, he forgets about Genesis chapters one and two, and uh, you know how what God originally intended, where one man would marry one woman and continue to stay faithful to her. So uh, Solomon forgets all of that later on in his life. So if he's the one who has written this book, this must be his very first wife that he is talking about over here in this book. And uh, so um, this book presents a picture of commitment. This is what commitment would look like. This is what love and adoration would look like, where you really value that person, even though she's, she's somebody who's dark skinned and who has come from the fields and who has no status. This is how uh, you know the king looks on her. This is how he respects her and adores her and loves her. So it's a, it's, it's a picture of what marriage should actually be like. So that would be the first interpretation. And then when we look at the Jewish people themselves, they began to use this book uh, to talk about the love which Yahweh has for his people, Israel. Because if you see, you know, if you think about it, the story of Israel is very similar to the story of this Shulamite woman. The Shulamite woman was from a very poor background. She had nothing. She had no value in human eyes. But the king chose her to be the queen. And if you look at the nation of Israel, what was their great grand status? 
they were just a bunch of slaves in egypt they had no value they had nothing to you know commend them but the king of kings and lord of lords chooses to accept them choose them as his special chosen nation and he in fact goes to the extent of saying i am a husband to you so you see there's a covenant that he enters into and so the jewish people start using this particular book um you know um in in uh, using it with that interpretation and they read it out during the passover feast because um during the passover uh, yahweh chooses to come to them who are in a very downtrodden state the same way the shulamite was being enslaved by her brothers who were making her work in the fields israelites too were enslaved by the egyptians but god comes to them he reaches out to them and he takes them to be you know his bride in that sense uh, so um, if we look at if someone could read out isaiah 54 verse 5 Uh, and uh, look at the relationship it talks about between Yahweh and the people of Israel. Isaiah fifty-four verse five. Hmm. Okay, so you have passages where it very clearly talks about Yahweh as being the husband of Israel. So that is the interpretation which they started to give. to this particular book and they would read it out during the passover feast every year and then when it came to the you know new testament church um the early church fathers you know um if you're doing church history you would you would have heard these names origen and jerome and athanasius these are the very early church fathers they said you know if the jewish people could take this book and think of it as the relationship between yahweh and the people of israel why don't we use the same imagery because after all uh, christ is supposed to be the bridegroom and the church is supposed to be the bride so if they could you know take this book and interpret it as yahweh's relationship with israel why can't we use this book in the same way and look look upon it as the relationship between christ and his church so that is basically how the idea the current idea which we hold today about uh, you know seeing this book in this light that is when it originated during the early church uh, period when they decided that they should start interpreting this book in this particular way and of course we have uh, you know new testament scriptures also which talk about jesus christ as the husband of the church so uh, you have second corinthians 11 verse 2 Uh, which is actually a very good verse um if someone could read out second corinthians 11:2 hmm yes so over here jesus christ is described as the husband in the same way in the old testament we saw yahweh being described as the husband of israel here very clearly christ is being described as the husband of the church so uh, what origen and jerome and athanasius and all the others they did it is valid it is a valid interpretation to take the book of uh, you know the song of solomon and see it in this light a fourth interpretation which we can bring to this book is we can think of it as the relationship between jesus christ and each individual believer because the bigger picture is christ and the church as a whole the corporate church as a whole but we can also take it as uh, the individual personal relationship which each believer has with christ uh, maybe one uh, verse that we can dwell upon one passage which we can look at could be ephesians chapter 5 Verses twenty three and twenty four. So, if someone could read out Ephesians chapter five, twenty three and twenty four. Okay, so here it talks about how the church must live in submission to Christ. um and in uh, in the same way every wife in her marriage relationship uh, should um, submit to her husband and uh, 
So when you break it down to the individual level, the same way a wife submits to her husband, each individual believer would need to submit to Christ. Okay, not a very direct, um, um, you know, um, a direct, a direct connection that you can draw, but it can also be applied. The Song of Solomon can also be applied as a um, uh, as a relationship between Christ and each individual believer. Now, one thing that uh, you know generally is overlooked when people are you know talking about the Song of Solomon, uh, they don't touch upon this great similarity which is there between Psalm forty-five and Song of Solomon, and it's very very interesting. If you were to look at Psalm forty-five over there, it's also talking about a wedding feast, you know, very similar to Song of Solomon, and over there. Um, who are the couple who are being discussed? You know, it talks about the anointed one of God, the, the one whom Yahweh has appointed, the one that uh, Yahweh has anointed as his, you know, uh, as his successor, you could say. Technically, basically, it's talking about the Messiah. Okay, so Psalm 45 is talking about the mighty one who will come one day. And so basically, it's talking about the Messiah and the Messiah's bride. So in Psalm 45, you literally have a psalm which is talking about Messiah, who is Jesus Christ, and his bride, who is the church. Now, uh, isn't that interesting? So it's not just in Song of Solomon where you have this kind of imagery, where you have the church being identified with Christ. Even in Psalm 45, you have a very clear reference to the coming Messiah who will one day come as the anointed one of God. He will come as the mighty one who will fight uh, you know, uh, on behalf of God and his bride, which is obviously the church. So um, if we were to look at Song of Solomon and Psalm 45, there's a lot of similarity. Um, in Psalm 45, the bride is not from a poor background, but she is an outsider. She's a Gentile. She is not um, uh, doesn't have this honorable status of being a Jewish person, but this is how uh, in Psalm forty-five, uh, uh, you know the the God speaks to her. Yeah, you can maybe just say that God speaks to her in this way. Psalm forty-five verses ten and eleven. If someone could read out that Psalm forty-five ten and eleven. Mm. Okay, so uh, here, um, you know, the Lord is addressing this foreign bride and he says to her, you know, forget your people, don't have to go on longing for what you had before, because now, you know, the, the, the king is, uh, is, is greatly desiring your beauty. He values you. He treasures you. So you don't have to go on thinking, oh, I lost my family. I lost my background. Now the king is there for you. He cares about you. And so he say, you know, it says over here, because he is your Lord, worship him. So in the same way, the Shulamite was given importance by the king in that story. Here in Psalm 45, even though this person is an outsider, this person is also being given importance. And the Lord says, you know, the king desires your beauty. He values you. He, he treasures you. So in both these places, we see that they are addressed as royalty. Okay. The Shulamite is not a royal, uh, from the royal lineage in any sense of the word. She's in fact from a very poor background from the tribe of Ephraim. But she is addressed as, um, as a princess. Uh, that is that would actually be in uh, Song of Solomon chapter 7 verse 1 where she is called a princess daughter okay so she's referred to as a princess in Song of Solomon 7 1 and here even in Psalm 45 verse 13 uh, this lady this foreigner is addressed as the royal daughter and look at the significance of this it's talking about a Gentile bride which actually, you know, is so uh, significant when we are thinking in terms of the church, because a, a large par part of the church is in fact Gentile. There are there are Jewish believers, but they are only a small portion. 
so in the in psalm 45 already when god is talking about the bride of the anointed one the bride of the messiah he's talking about gentile people who will be the bride and the gentiles can proudly say oh we don't have to long for our culture and what we have left behind the king of kings is desiring us he values us he treasures us so we see the beauty of that coming out um in both the uh, song of solomon and in psalm 45 um all right we only have 2 minutes left so maybe we can just stop over here um yeah anyone wants to ask any questions otherwise we'll close with a word of prayer no all right so we'll just close with a word of prayer lord we just thank you so much for uh, the things that we could learn from your scripture today we thank you oh lord that our lives really do hold meaning in you sometimes we go through hard times sometimes we work very hard for something and uh, nothing seems to come out of it but we know now lord that you have an eternal plan and because you have an eternal plan for us you will work out everything the good things the things which did not work out everything you oh lord will bring it together uh, because you have an eternal plan for us so we thank you oh lord that uh, even though life doesn't always make sense under the sun because you are seated above the sun and your eyes are upon us and you care about us so we can indeed have meaning in our lives so we thank you oh lord for this also lord we thank you that you treasure us that you value us even though we are not uh, you know we were not born royal nor were we born divine but lord we were just humans but you chose to love us to the extent where you were willing to sacrifice your son for us so it's an amazing uh, boost in status which we have received a lot we who were living in our sin and dying in our sin have now been elevated to the status of being the very bride of the king of kings it's amazing what a high status you have given us a lot so we pray that we would live in a way which uh, is honorable in a way where we appreciate what you have actually done for us where we would recognize that we who are nothing have been made the 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 bride of the king himself and we would value that and we would appreciate the great sacrifice which you have gone through to give us that status oh lord and i pray that we would live lives that will please you and honor you and maybe show our gratitude for what you have done for us lord thank you lord in jesus name amen yeah thank you so much for you know paying attention and listening and uh, yeah thanks to all of you online